Hello and welcome to Tim's BMW Repairs and Information. And this video is all about the cooling system on the V8 and the V12 models such as the E31, E32, E38, E39. But the way the cooling system works this video will be useful for the straight sixes and the straight fours as well. I was going to do a single video covering the whole cooling system but the further I got into the subject I realised that it's just impossible. The video would be too long and I don't have enough chance to cover each of the components. So what this video is, is an introduction to the cooling system and I also do other videos which covers each bit in particular. But let's first of all start looking at the major components of the system. First one we'll have a look at will be the auxiliary fan. This isn't really part of the cooling system, but it does help out when things go wrong. And here it is on an E31. Main coolant radiator, well we all know what one of those is. On the left hand side you can see the top hose connection, right hand side the bottom hose is the viscous fan. This one's on an E38. Lower hose, it's a rotten photo, but it shows the pipe pulled off of the lower hose of the radiator. Top hose, well that one's a bit easier to see. That's on an E31. Pump itself is quite complicated, but here it is on a E38, it's been taken apart. Expansion tank, we're all familiar with those, but they are a darn sight more complicated than first seen. Coolant accumulator runs between the heads at the back of the V8s and the V12s, and that's that casting that runs left to right. And then the coolant transfer tubes, which we can see here, large one for the engine cooling, the smaller one for the cabin heater. And a couple more important points. Here's the bleeding pipe, one which takes air and coolant back to the expansion tank, and one that runs from the expansion tank to the water pump. Um, Coolant is circulated through the expansion tank all the time. Right, next thing, let's have a look at where temperatures are measured. Where the temperature gauge and this digital readout is showing that it's measured at the water pump or the coolant accumulator. And if you watch the um, temperature gauge on the top left of the picture, you'll notice that it's stopped in the middle about 75 degrees C. The thermostat acts on temperatures within the water pump, and we'll come on to that later. Um, so yeah, the temperature gauge at the bottom, which is showing 100 C, is the digital readout as could be found on, on lock, unlocking the OBC. Oh, the viscous fan, that only operates in response to the temperature of the air coming from the main coolant radiator. It doesn't work on coolant temperature as such or engine temperature. It works on the air temperature coming through from the radiator. And that's not the same as the coolant of the radiator because that all depends on how fast the car's moving through the air and so on. Now the auxiliary fan helps out when things go wrong and that's got its own sensor on the coolant outlet of the radi radiator in the lower hose. Right, so that's where the temperatures are all measured. Water pump, obviously the most important part of the cooling system. And I'll stick some labels on there that goes to the bottom hose, that's the top hose. Engine temperature sensor um, from the expansion tank as seen already. Thermostat housing and the thermostat heater if you're unlucky enough to have one on the E38 and the E39. Now the thermostat is contained within the water pump and the sensing element is to the right. This is a fixed thermostat and if it's an E31 then that will be an 85 degree C thermostat. And the temperature map, mapped thermostats there as one unit have a connector on and they're effectively a 108 degree C thermostat but with the ability to open it earlier. Right, here's other pictures of the water pump and as you can see it just appears to be full of holes and it's quite interesting how the coolant flows through it and it's not immediately obvious when you first look at it. Here's the flow restrictor 
that shiny bit there that's very important and this side is the pump itself at the bottom and then the inputs from the coolant transfer pipes and uh, let's have a look at the water flow through the engine to start with well we already know where the water pump is and if we remove the water pump you'll find a sort of shell shaped hole um, helix shape which directs uh, the coolant into the valley pan you can see this sort of rectangular hole there and if we add the coolant you can see this is where the coolant starts to flow from the pump which is gravity fed into the valley and pops out the lower casting and gets redirected into the other side of the cylinder walls it will go through the heads and will appear at the coolant accumulator and this red arrow is the engine coolant coming back to the water pump and the blue ones from the heater matrix uh, we're not so interested in that at the moment and here's the water pump against the diagram which shows us lower hose thermostat mixing chamber pump um, the coolant transfer pipe temperature sensor and the top hose connections so they're all there right let's have a look at the diagram again with the uh, coolant circulating the system and the first thing to notice is that when the um, thermostats close water doesn't circulate through the radiator at all apart from a tiny bit going through to the expansion tank and I'll explain that a bit later and so thermostat closed you get a tiny amount of water uh, coolant going into the expansion tank circulates through that and back to the pump and you can see here the coolant flow through there it goes through this weird shaped double walled pipe within the expansion tank and again we'll look at that later and I'll explain why it's like that and um, so here's the coolant flow and we get up to about 85 degrees C when you've got an 85 degree C stat fitted and the thermostat will start to open it doesn't just open it opens in respect to temperature so it opens a tiny bit at 85 degrees C and it will start letting coolant from the main radiator back through to the engine and it does this very slowly because of course you can't have very cold coolant going straight into the engine as that would damage it so what happens is the coolant, hot coolant from the engine, is mixed with the cool coolant from the radiator to provide 85 degrees C at the mixing chamber. And you can see why, because the sensing element of the thermostat is in the mixing chamber. Um, and when you're actually on the move in the car, this is all the cooling you need because you have cooling air coming through the radiators and the car will sit on the highway or on the motorway all day at 95 degrees C as measured at the uh, temperature gauge on the right hand side of the pump of course in the mixing chamber it's still 85 degrees C now of course if you're in a different situation where you're in stop go traffic or you're just the engine's just ticking over then you don't actually get any uh, cooling air coming through the radiator and this is what the viscous coupled fans for so that when you're in stop go traffic the cooling isn't sufficient so the viscous coupled fan comes into operation and we'll have a look at the fan now and the fan comprises of two parts really um, the important part in here are these concentric circles which are milled into both the rotor and the stator so if the rotor driven by the engine via the, the uh, belt and uh, that fits neatly inside those concentric circles obviously exaggerated in this diagram uh, we'll add the airflow and at 50 degrees C all you're getting for the rotation of the fan is just the, the drag from the bearings and the seals and it puts in part so little pressure on the fan you can stop it with your hand and uh, the, the actual torque is very low altogether now the fan does is in two states it's either on or it's off
but on isn't fully on so you reach 92.4 degrees C the viscous fluid flows from the reservoir and it goes between the two points between the two sets of concentric circles and imparts a shear force and the shear force is what drives the fan and that's useful because the shear force is set by the viscosity of the fluid and it means no matter how fast you rev the engine the fan will never go above 2500 rpm and then when it reaches 60 degrees C the fluid flows out of the concentric castings and goes back to the reservoir and the fan then returns to its uh, normal state which is just idling. Now it's important to realize that this doesn't the fan doesn't add a bit of cooling it's either on or it's off and when it's on it imparts a torque to the fan which limits the amount of rev uh, the speed that the fan can actually go. They go wrong in two ways. You can lose the fluid, in which case it will do nothing at all. It'll just idle, or it will see whether well, bearings will seize up, and then it will attain the uh, revolutions of the water pump pulley, in which case it can just throw itself apart, because the centrifugal force of the fan blades just tears the thing apart. Um, but important to realise, two-state device. Okay, expansion tank. Very clever thing. It's all full of separated parts in there and it's all designed to stop air going back into the water pump. And this is the reason the engine's self-bleeding. And I can hear people saying, well, it isn't self-bleeding. Well, it is. The engine is, but the heater system isn't. Now, here's this double wall pipe and this separates the air that comes through from the top of the radiator, which is the highest point, and here's the pipe from it. It separates the air from the coolant so the air goes from the right hand side and back up the left hand side there's the pipe the red thing um, two sides hole at the bottom and also when the engine is stopped um, it will not siphon air back into the radiator and here we can see the coolant flow going from the top of the radiator through the expansion tank back to the water pump so very important it separates air from coolant and it does that automatically all the time and hence the engine itself is completely self bleeding although there may be some initial bleeding to be done with the bleed screw from then on in it will bleed itself but unfortunately the heater system is the Achilles heel of the whole thing first of all though we'll have a quick look at the auxiliary fan which is used for the air conditioning system but it has a second use, which is when the viscous coupled fan fails, say we've run out of the viscous fluid, and I'm showing it here just sitting there doing nothing, then the engine will overheat. And you notice at 120C, the gauge starts coming off the centre, and so the engine's getting pretty hot. Unfortunately, the pressure within the expansion tank stopping the boiling. Now, when we reach a temperature of 99 degrees C on the lower hose which is about 135 degrees c at the temperature sensor then the auxiliary fan will run at full speed and it has just enough effort to cool the coolant down to a safe point but unfortunately as soon as it the fan stops which it will do once the gauge reaches the center things start overheating again and so the gauge starts heading towards the red and if you have this scenario where the gauge keeps hanging, uh, heading towards the three-quarter mark and then going back again, you can be absolutely sure that's due to the viscous couple fan failing and the auxiliary fan saving the day. So that's one good reason to keep your auxiliary fan in good condition because it can certainly help you out in this sort of situation. Very important to have an auxiliary fan that works. There we go, saving the day and off again. And it will keep doing that until uh, you sort it out. Right, the cabin heater, quick look at that. Um, what's the problem with the cabin heater? Well, the trouble is that it's higher than the rest of the system. So you can see that pipe going to the auxiliary water pump. There's the pump itself. 
actually goes up. Well, there's the heater valves. It actually goes upwards from the um, coolant transfer pipe. To get the auxiliary pump, set the controls to the highest setting and put the fan on. And here's the, the coolant flows coming from the coolant transfer pipe, oh, sorry, the coolant accumulator through the auxiliary water pump, past the valves, through the cabin heater, and then back down to the water pump. So here's an airlock, which is in the highest point. How to get it to move? Well, we have to rev the engine up. That really gets the coolant moving through. And uh, your only problem is, is it sure it gets rid of the Air, leak, uh, air blocks within the cabin heater and the pipework because it doesn't lead to the radiator it leads back to the water pump so all the air that you've just pumped out there it goes straight back through the water pump and back into the engine again and this is why it's so notoriously difficult to bleed these engines is because not only do you have to get the air out of the heater system You've now got to wait for it to travel through the engine, through the accumulator, through the transfer pipe, and uh, eventually to the radiator. Right, well, that's enough for this quick introduction. Um, I'll be doing a series of videos on each of the parts. And thanks for watching. <laughs>